I am sure some of you may remember the two gaming rigs one tower video LTT did about 8 years ago, or any of its successors. In this video I want to share our journey of achieving a similar goal nearly a decade later. We are recording this after my partner and I used the system daily for a year, so I'll also review our experience with it, the good and the bad. So how did we get here? We've both been using laptops for quite a while, but our workloads started to get more and more demanding. My partner in particular was working on a thesis and needed to crunch a lot of numbers. Sure, you can get a more powerful laptop, but if you want a portable thin and light, it is nowadays still an expensive compromise. We also both use Linux, and at least for me, not having to plug in an external monitor would solve many of the hurdles I was experiencing with it. Initially, we thought about building two towers and calling it a day, but then the idea of building just one, like really powerful tower, came up. Building one tower has its advantages, like less overhead with just one power supply, one motherboard and one case to dust off. So it can be cheaper and it saves some space. So why doesn't everybody use shared computers? Well, it makes things a lot more complicated. To merge two desktops into one that behaves like two, you need to run two separate operating systems, where each has some way of connecting peripherals. This is enabled by virtualization and features that allow assigning hardware to VMs. However, we couldn't justify spending thousands of euros on a professional workstation that could do that. These days, it's easy and affordable to rent time on a powerful server if needed. So I had a certain budget in mind for this project. I started by looking into consumer-grade options and did a lot of research on Zen 3 and running the Proxmox hypervisor on it. One big limitation is that consumer platforms only have 20 PCIe lanes, 16 for the GPU and 4 for the bridge. Bifurcation is only supported on high-end chipsets and its support varies, especially for GPU pass-through. Remember, I did this research a year ago, so things may have changed since then. Then, out of curiosity, I turned my attention to server platforms. I knew that connecting more graphics cards wouldn't be an issue there. I started browsing the second-hand market and I stumbled upon a deal that sounded too good to be true, an AMD Epic ROM with 64 gigs of ECC memory and some Intel SSD, all for about 600 euro. I called the seller and I asked if I could trade the SSD for more RAM. The seller agreed and sounded legit, so we arranged to meet the next day. With the CPU taken care of, we bought the minimum needed to get the system up and test our theory. The new motherboard costs us 600 euro. Plus, we bought a new power supply for 120 and an SSD. So for a total of around 1400 euro, we should have the bare bones of a server-grade system with 64 threads and 128 gigs of RAM. The motherboard is fantastic. If you want to replicate this build with newer components, I highly recommend looking into these workstation-grade motherboards. They are a unique breed, supporting server CPUs while also offering basic desktop features like audio, plenty of USB ports, onboard graphics and more. This one even includes two built-in M.2 slots, two 10GB NICs, plenty of SATA and some other exotic connectivity options. But for us, the main attraction was the seven PCIe slots connected directly to the CPU. This is crucial because each slot on this platform is assigned to a different IOMMU group, allowing it to be passed through to the VM independently. This little detail allows us to achieve our goal of hosting multiple users and is one of the main differences between server and consumer platforms. On to the setup itself. I'm not going to go into too many details here, but if you want to dive into it, check the video description. For the bring up, we set everything up temporarily, connecting our old GTX 770 and a GTX 1060, which we picked up secondhand for 100 euro, and installed Proxmox on the system. From there, I created two Ubuntu VMs and followed the guide for setting up GPU pass-through. To my surprise, everything worked on the first try. We just needed to enable legacy BIOS mode for the system to boot with the old 770 installed. Going into this, I expected to be able to tell I was using a VM, but honestly, I couldn't. On a 60Hz monitor, I am willing to go as far to say that you can't tell the difference between using the desktop in a VM with a dedicated GPU and a bare metal install. With the proof of concept done, we ordered the remaining components like the USB cards for each host and the computer case. 
After about 8 months, the old GTX 770 died unfortunately, so we needed to replace it. And with that we decided to also shoot this video and do regular maintenance on the computer. And with that I would now like to leave the next part of this video to my partner, who was the main motivator behind this build and also uses it extensively. I must admit that I was rather skeptical of this idea at first, as I did not really see a clear benefit in having one big PC instead of two smaller and cheaper ones. Also, giving 600 euros for the CPU to a random guy on a street was a bit too much for me. But in the end, after using this computer for a year, I must say that the gamble was very worth it and I could not be happier with the end result. The biggest benefit for me personally is the available compute, as it's a lot more than what I would have been able to achieve on a normal desktop computer within my budget. I now have 32 cores, 128 gigs of RAM, and a GPU available if needed, which is a very nice upgrade coming from a laptop without a GPU. Thanks to this, I can now run my machine learning models in minutes instead of hours or days. We have a combined office and a living room, so I was afraid of the noise that the computer would produce because of all the components that need cooling. But thankfully the case we chose solved all my worries and when I'm sitting in the living room I cannot even tell if the computer is running or not. The only disadvantage I see so far is that both of us have to have our computers turned off to be able to turn off the computer as a whole which is, of course, not ideal for the power consumption. Even saying that, I would definitely do it again, as it proved to be quite an efficient way of combining budgets for two computers and getting something much much better than two computers in exchange.